Today on The State of Us, the left and right face a deep divide and a loss of identity. Voters on the left and right fear losing their identity, according to a recent article in the Wall Street Journal. Many in the GOP dislike the socialist left, while Democrats fret over the loss of equal rights. Today, we're going to talk about what exactly is going on with the fear of loss of identity. Also take a look at how new state laws reinforce this notion and how millennials are not an exception. It appears they may have moved some to the right, but that headline doesn't tell the full story. So we've got a lot to talk about. Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined today by the one and only, your friendly redneck liberal and the senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance Jackson. Why can't we be friends? I don't know, man. It's just, but it's the article about the right and the left. It's just, it really signifies that there is a deep divide in the thought of what America is and what America should be. And the millennial story is not that surprising in that, you know, when you get older and all of a sudden you have bills to pay and you're taking care of children or your parents or, you know, you have more responsibility, you tend to start to maybe not be quite as far out there with your ideas because you're starting to realize mom and dad weren't as far off as you thought they were. So let's get started. What do you got first? So uh, first up is a piece from this initial article that says the animating force in the Republican presidential primary, many voters and policy leaders say, is a feeling that American society, the government, the media, Hollywood, academia, and big business has been corrupted by liberal ideas about race gender, and other social matters. Democrats, in turn, feel that the conservatives have used their political power in red states and in building a Supreme Court majority to undermine abortion rights and threaten decades of work to broaden equal rights for minority groups. You know, is it really race and and gender and education and all that, or, or are people just afraid of change? I mean, I, I really... I've spent a lot of time because we've had this article for for a little bit and I've read it and reread it and I'm trying to think, what is it that people are afraid of? All, all, all these things they say they're worried about. And I've got friends. I've got friends that I taught with that I talk to, you know, on a bi, you know, every other week or, or a monthly basis. And they're just like, oh, the country's oh, oh, oh. I'm like, well, is it really? I mean, what is it that you're afraid of? The fact that we're treating people better and treating people, wanting to treat people as equals more than we ever have? Are you you, you afraid of that? I mean, what, what do you have against that? And yet they do. Well, you know, when I was growing up, well, yeah, when you were growing up, we were mistreating a lot of people. You know, do you not remember those things? You know, I was talking to you on, you know, earlier about, you know, millennials and stuff. I was like, yeah, well, we had Vietnam. We had Richard Nixon. You know, we had Watergate. We had, there was some, some bad crap going on, you know, when we were growing up. And it's like, people want to go back to us. Like, why? You know, what is it they're really afraid of? Right? What, what is it really? I mean, you're saying it's race. You're saying it's gender. You're saying it's the moral fabric of the country. Are you kidding me? What moral fabric did we have? I mean, do you not read history in that we had multiple presidents who <clears throat> had multiple marital affairs while they were in office? I, well, there's, you had presidents who were sleeping with slaves. You know, what moral fiber are you trying to recapture? So there's an inset in the article that maybe helps shed a little light in 
uh, a Wall Street Journal NORAC poll this year, three quarters of Republicans said that society had gone too far in accepting transgender people. More than half of Republicans said that society had overstepped in accepting gay and lesbian people and that businesses and schools had gone too far in promoting racial and ethnic diversity. Far fewer Democrats held those views. What are they afraid of with people who want to live their life that way? or who feel better and happier, right? Isn't that America, home of the brave, you know, land of the free? Aren't you free to live the way you want to live as long as you don't infringe on others? And for, for, for me to live with somebody of, of the same sex or to have or, or of a different color or whatever, what, is, what business, how does that hurt your ability to live free? How does that hurt your ability to live your life the way you want to? Why do you have to have the right to tell everybody else how they should live their life? This is America where you're supposed to be free to live your life the way you want to. So you go live your life the way you want to and let these other people live life the way they want to. Why does everybody have to live their life the way you want to? them to live their life or the way you want to live your life. Am I missing something? Well, in in an Ipsos poll this March, about half of Republicans agreed with the statement, quote, these days I feel like a stranger in my own country. Fewer than 30 percent of Democrats agreed. While past GOP primary races have turned in part on policy disputes such as remaking Medicare, the differences among candidates this year have been more a muted part of the discussion. Very few people are talking about tax reform and everybody is talking about cultural issues. To answer your question, I think part of it is that people naturally, right, people of all backgrounds, people fear change to a degree, some people more than others. I would contend that the parties have decided that that's a good opportunity to play on people's fears. And rather than playing to our highest sense of self, they've decided to play to our lowest sense of self. And when your leaders are saying, you know, I don't know this, you know, this and this and this, they could be problems. And that's why, you know, that's why you're not doing well. And, and, and this is the unraveling of society. And, you know, I mean, those are things that to people who are searching for answers and who are frustrated or who feel confused, right? Or who are scared. Those are super easy things to latch onto. You gave me somebody to blame. You explain the problem. Sounds to me like that's the problem. Yeah. Never self-examine, right? Never, never look at yourself. Now, you know, what is it? What's the Bible say? Ye without sin cast the first stone, right? Keep, keep blaming everybody else. Don't look at yourself and see what you're not doing right or that what you're not doing well, or examine yourself as to what's causing these things to happen to you, just force all of your concerns on other people and it's their fault, right? It's like a a coach of mine once said, don't ever point a finger at somebody else because if you're pointing to them that it's their fault, four of those fingers are pointing back at you. Yep. And so, I mean, oh, well, well, you, you, you mean because I'm living in this place that, or I have this crappy job or whatever, that's my fault. It's not, <laughs> you, you mean, uh, 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 well, what am I supposed to do about it? I don't know. Figure it out, but maybe don't spend all day blaming other people for your issues. But you live in a, you live in a country where you can do that. I get that. But you also live in a country where you can do what you want to do to fix your own problems. You don't have to put the weight of the world of your problems on other people. You're free to do something different to solve your problems. Those people, whoever air quotes those people are, are not the reason why your life is unhappy. The reason your life is unhappy is because of you and the decisions you've made. So quit transfixing you. I don't know if I'm using this correctly. 
your issues onto other people and saying, well, if we get rid of these people, my life's going to be a whole lot better. You know what? It's not. You got to fix you. Well, and if you're I, unhappy, fix you. Maybe the biggest takeaway for me from the article is right near the end where it says the heightened feelings on both sides are reflected in a poll that found about 80% of Republicans believe that the Democratic agenda, quote, if not stopped, will destroy America as we know it. And about the same share of Democrats had the same fear of the Republican agenda saying it would destroy the country. An NBC News survey found last fall. So you got about 80%. Well, to your point, to your point, you you made you made the only rational comment in this segment. I'm just <laughs> Well, no. I'm, I'm just you just pissed. made a rational comment. I, I'm just by... pissed off at everybody, you know? I mean, at people who who have to feel this way uh. about other people. But it is. It's the politicians don't want to take on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, climate control, the budget, you know, they don't want to take on those issues. So we're just going to create these other things to make you afraid of other people so that you will support us and send us your money. You know, I mean, that's, you're exactly right. That's what's going on. And if you study the history of our country, it's been done before. Right. And again, and Politicians I know you love always to make prey fun on of me, people's fears, but I'm kind of defending myself here. As you get older, and it kind of leads into the next article too. As you get older, you start to realize there's not a lot of whole lot of new things that happen. It has gone on before. And when you study the history of our country, many of these same issues have occurred at other periods of time in our history. And we came out and we're better for it. Why are you against freedom of people? to choose to live their life the way they want to. Isn't that what you want? Right? I mean, I, I want that. I want the freedom to look and do and read whatever I want to. Don't you want that for everybody? You know, don't you want that too? I, 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 don't, I don't understand why people have to have everybody live like them. What, what's, what, what's happy about, what, how is that going to make you happier? What's that, you know, I mean, for the, 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 then you don't have to think too hard. I don't have to think. I look at something. I like it. Okay. If I don't like it, I put it aside. If somebody else likes what I don't like, great. Why is that? How does that change my life? <laughs> how, how, right? I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I wish I had you know, a way you, to, you, you, <laughs> to do a better I mean, job of defending the opposition, but I struggle pe people, to do it. <laughs> people decide to spend their life with people that, that I don't like. Okay. It's their choice though. If it makes them happy, right? It has nothing to do with their male or female or black. I mean, I just don't like a lot of people. So, you know, I mean, I've got. I've got all kinds of different couples in my life that I run along. And the reason they're in my life is because I like them. You know, it has nothing to do because they're doing it the way I want them to do it. It's because they're happy and because the they're happy, I'm happy. When you were bringing up your children, what, what was best for them? Didn't you want them to be happy? And so now your grown children are happy and they're living a lifestyle that you don't understand, but they're happy. Isn't that what you wanted? And then just take that on a, on a bigger level, right? I mean, just start there. Okay, so don't you want all people to be happy? So why not let everybody, if they're not again, if they're inflicting your ability to live the way you want to live, that's wrong. Okay, but if you can still go to the and shop where you want to shop and you can buy the things you want to buy and you can live in the space you want to live. And if you want to attend church, you get to attend church. And if you want to go see certain kinds of movies, you can go see. Some, oh, wait a minute. And if they don't make the kind of movie that you want, you know what you're free to do in America? Make your own movie. Make your own movie. <laughs> Write your own. You don't, I don't like the books that are in the library. Write your own books. Right. If enough people agree with you, you can make money off of it. The thing that's that, that I find to be super interesting is almost always when I run across the, you know, people that we would know as like keyboard warriors, which are those people that 
Don't yeah. have anything better to do in their life? Well, but that's but that's exactly the point of often what I what I almost send your messages feel, my way, you keyboard warriors. I just said it. You don't have anything better to do in your life. Is but that's what I feel like when you see a lot of them. Is it's like you look at that person. It's like, man. It must be really miserable to be you, yeah. you know, because like your day is so filled with hatred and, right. and, and, and loneliness and, and dislike and why we're going to talk about how new state laws are sort of bringing to light this deeper divide. Keep it here on the state of us. We'll be right back. Florida, Minnesota, Iowa, Ohio, well, you could go on and on, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Carolina, Wyoming. What do you want to talk about? Which state you want to talk about first, Lance? I mean, we could take your pick. You could do a whole show on in the recent, like last year or so, the battles being fought at the state level that are illuminating the divide, not just at the federal level, oh, right, but down to the state level. I know it, it doesn't matter because it is, it's a battle because people, people want to control the way other people live. I don't, I don't understand that in America. I know I'm pushing one theme today, but that's what I don't get. I supposedly live in the freest country in the world, except the battle is over everybody trying to, to tell me how I'm supposed to live. We, we revolted against the, I mean, that's why it's a battle. That's why there's battles in these states because there are people saying, no, you know, and they're not saying it for the reason I'm saying it, but they're saying, no, you don't, we don't want you to tell us how to do it, but, and how to live. But that's what we told the King of England, right? Didn't we do a show not long ago, Lance, though, about how, you know, only like 13% of American students are uh, scoring yeah, proficient but these are in adults. civics? But these are adults. But I mean, how do we expect... It, it, that whole that whole notion of do we really expect people to know that can 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 most Americans tell you why we fought the okay, revolutionary I'm telling war? You, I'm telling them now. I know. All right. I, I'm not. I'm shouting it from but, the mountaintop. But right? we fought for the freedom to live our life the way we want to. Mm. Get up on Sunday morning and instead of going to church, watch Daniel Boone on the Inspiration Channel, which is a religious channel. Daniel Boone walked off over the Appalachian Mountains to a place called Kentucky. Why? Because he didn't want anybody telling him what to do. He wanted to create a place where people could just come and do their own thing and get along with the Native Americans. And just people were allowed to live the way they wanted to and defend their land and defend their families and do it the way they wanted to. Not They weren't trying to make anybody live like them. They just said, we want to go and live the way we want to live. And that's what the United States is all about. The foundation of this country is compromise. And we've decided, for whatever reason, that compromise is now a bad thing. You know, we can't compromise. You can't give ground. And that's why you end up with states. And again, they're listed throughout this article where Republicans and Democrats, depending on the state, uh, like in Minnesota, the Democrats, you know, pressed their advantage and used it to put in place laws that about half of the state hates, you know? Right. And and you go to Iowa, and then it's the opposite. The right. Republicans use their advantage to do the opposite of what about half of the state wanted, you know? So, and it's not like, oh, they did something that's a little different than what people wanted. It's like, no, we did what 10 or 20% of the people wanted, and we got, you know, 80% of the people to now live that way, which is the very thing that we were talking about in the first segment of the show is basically – small groups forcing, you know, many people to try, trying to force many people to do things a certain way. And aren't way. we free to voice or supposed to be free to voice our opinions if we don't like what's going on? Sure. It wasn't okay. that what we're doing right now? Exactly. Right. I mean, so, so if, if somebody's doing something you don't like, you have the right to say that you don't like that, but we also live where I don't know. I understand majority rule. I get, I just don't, I, again, I just don't get it. Okay. I just don't get it. You would not want other people telling you how to live. So why do you want to have the right to tell other people how to live? 
that's what I, I, I just don't understand that, Justin. One interesting that, that's my thing basic concept that's been taking place that I that I'm curious to see how it plays out over the next couple of decades is it feels like there's this beginning of resurgence in interest in state rights across both parties for different reasons. Um which which I I think is interesting on on the surface level because from a theoretical standpoint about the way we're organized, it is just that, that there can be states where we decide that we want to live a certain way. And then there can be a state over next, it can be a neighboring state that decides, well, we don't want to do it that way. We want to do it this way. Right. Um, the, the thing that's difficult about that when you remove theory from it is you have lots of people living in states, right, where that's just where they were born. It's where they've been their whole life. It's where their job is, where their family is. So it's easier said than done, I guess, to simply say, well, what we'll just do is, you know, we got 50 states in this country and we have territories. We could we could have something like 55 or 60 states if we really wanted to. You know, there's probably a few states we could break into two or three. So we do that. And then you can have a state that's every flavor of everything you've ever wanted, and you go to whichever state you know you like the best. Well, that sounds nice on the surface, but obviously the, the the issue with that being that if I live in Maine and I've lived there my whole life and I work a minimum wage job, I moving to California is probably going to be complicated, if not impossible. You know, um, in in terms of just financially not not realistic. So. I don't know. That's that's tough because because uh, America has been. I mean, historically, right? We've been a very transient society. Um, as, that's one of the freedoms we have, right? Is if is I don't that, like it I don't here, like I can it. go somewhere else. Or if I hear there's an opportunity, I don't have you know. And understand, people, since you maybe according to Justin, you haven't been taught this. There are many countries where you have to apply to the government to get the right to move from one state or one part of the country to another one. Yeah. You know, the United you States, you don't just, I don't have to ask anybody. If I want to move, I just up and move. I mean, that's a glorious thing that we have that a lot of other people don't have. I'm going to do this and, and see what you think. I'm going to tell you this. Isn't it the reality is that most of us agree with what I'm saying and the people causing all the consternation are the extremes the middle of the extremes of each group. Uh -huh. Yep. hundred percent because we, and, and we've already done some shows on this, but we just keep reinforcing it. The two party system only serves the extremes. That's the only people it's because it gives them an outsized voice, right? Say for example, there were five parties, right? One that's in the middle, one that's moderately right, one that's moderately left, and then two extremes. Well, who has the least power in that equation? The two extremes. You might say, well, how? Because you just said there's five, so doesn't everybody have uh, approximately? Per no, because the middle probably has the greatest because they can swing one way or the other. But those two moderate right and moderate lefts, they're just as likely to go centrist or maybe even go to the other side as the others. So now yeah, you've the created- the extremes would be 10 to 15%. Right. So that means you have 70% in the middle group or middle right or middle left make up 70% And how much could that your, group get done? Or 80% of your and, population. And if that right. group feels that most of the time they just want to be left alone and let everybody do their own thing and be happy, you know, now the extremes are the ones that are the alienated ones. But instead, I guess what I'm trying to point out is it's the, it's the exact opposite right now. We've basically convinced people that you only have two choices, right? So you're either with us or you're against us. And if you're with us, you got to be all with us or you're against us. And and guess who, you know, pushes that me that that message and ideology? It's the far right and the far left because that gives them more power. But you're not allowed to compromise anymore. Well, you that's just what said I mean. That, you just said that earlier in the show. Yeah. Compromise is a is a we sign, don't do that. Is a sign of weakness. Yep. You know, if you give in and compromise, then you're too weak. You um what do we say with John Kerry? You're a flip flopper. Yeah. You yeah. know, you can't change if really you can't change your mind. You can't become educated about something and then have a different opinion. Well, where how has that become an American ideal? Yep. 
that you're not supposed well, we're, to. We're afraid of that you're knowledge. not supposed to learn yep. and maybe come to a new conclusion because you got some information that you didn't know before. Be open minded. I mean, what what are Thomas Jefferson and and John Adams doing in their graves right now? <laughs> that where we're saying you're not allowed to learn something new. You're not allowed to question. Yeah, we don't want you to change your mind. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've- Changing your mind is now a sign of weakness. That's right. And it's like- Are you kidding me? But follow that out too to its conclusion, right? Folks that are listening at home. If if that's what we're saying, then you're saying you really don't want the other side to ever come to your side. Because you don't want- you Right, because they'd have to change their mind. They have to change their mind. You don't want them to do that. Right. You just want them to go away. That's what you want. You know, so you don't want to convince them. You you don't want anything to do with them ever, even if they came over to your side. You just want them to go away. And and I don't think that that's, that to me doesn't seem like what we're supposed to be about. I think if you ask those people who are in the far right or the far left, they'd say, well, no, that's not what we want. But that's what you're doing. But that's the impact. That's what you're doing. Right. right. That's the consequence right. of it. So for the last segment, we're going to take a little time to talk about how millennials appear like they might not be an exception and have moved to the right, but why that doesn't exactly tell the full story. Keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. In the 2020 presidential election, According to the Wall Street Journal, voters were who were 18 to 29 in 2008 backed Joe Biden by 55 percent to 43 percent, according to our estimates, a margin that was roughly half that of Mr. Obama's 12 years earlier. The exit polls show it even closer with Mr. Biden winning by just 51-45 among voters who were 18 to 27 in 2008. Exit polls report results among those 30 to 39, not 30 to 41, the group that was 18 to 29 in 2008. And last fall, the young voters of 08, by then 32 to 43-year-old, preferred Democratic congressional candidates by just 10 points in a time Siena polling. But a different story emerges by tracking the same cohort of voters over time rather than a whole generation with changing composition. The millennials of 2008 are not the same as those of 2016, for instance. Six additional years of even more heavily Democratic millennials became eligible to vote after the 2008 election, canceling out the slight Republican shift among older millennials. The shift to the right appears to be the largest among the oldest young voters, the older millennials who came of age in a very different political era from today. Many of the issues that drew young voters to the Democrats in 2004 or 2008, like the Iraq war or same-sex marriage, may no longer be issues at all. Republicans may have even reversed their former disadvantage on some issues, whether by sometimes opposing foreign intervention, winning some voters with colorblind messaging on race, or by becoming the, quote, anti-establishment party. In contrast, the shift to the right is more modest among younger voters, especially those who came of age after Mr. Obama in the era of Black Lives Matter, the Bernie Sanders campaign, and Donald Trump. Today's politics are still mostly defined by the same issues that brought these voters to the Democrats. As long as that's true, they may well remain by their side. So in a lot of ways, I think what this is contending, Lance, is that you have in in essence two very different voting blocks of millennials based on their age and the life events that they were growing up with knowledgeable about at the time they came to vote and i would say i would add to that what they've gone through in their life so far sure because there's a big difference between being in your mid to late 30s and early 40s than to being in your late 20s and early 30s Exactly. I mean, well, and that's exactly and, what the article I think is. And, then, and that, but that's pointing. It out. doesn't matter whether you're a millennial or a boomer or Gen X or Gen Z. That will be true. Just because of the way we we are brought up in this country, there are just things that you don't experience or don't do as a total group. 
You know, some people sure. some people do it earlier, some people do it later. But your your mid twenties to early thirties is like one segment of your life. And then, you know, that that age of thirty four to thirty seven, thirty eight, you start to change and you hit your forties and it's, you know, for lack of a better term, we call it a midlife crisis, but it's when you start to really take a look at your life and what you've done because your, your life's about half over and okay, this is what I said I wanted to accomplish. What have I accomplished and where am I going next and have my goals stayed the same or have my goals changed? And so of course you're going to, the events, the, the issues haven't changed, but your perspective is going to change because your perspective on life is changing because you've reached that stage where you begin to question and say, do I, have I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish? Is it time to create new goals or do I want to, were the goals I I set as an 18 year old, do I still want to work towards those goals or do I want to work towards something different? I would contend that, you know, basically since 2016, right? Pre 2016, um, by, you know, a year or so, we started to ask this question as a nation or or as a voting populace. And I think we're still asking it. I don't think we've answered it yet of what do we want the new dynamic in politics to be, right? What does the left stand for? What does the right stand for? And well, we don't what want, do we stand for and how they're going to interact with each but other? But we don't want new or different because we're still electing old white men. Whether they're Democrat or Republic, we're still electing old white men to run the country for the for the, for the last eight years. Yeah, well, I, but that, I mean, no, that's to me. Come on, that's a big change. We won't elect a woman. We 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 had we had Obama, and now it's like, oh, we're going to run from that. And and now here we are in the campaign for twenty twenty four. And what are we looking at? We're still. And even if you throw in. You know, 2020, say, oh, but we had Bernie Sanders. He had had an old white man. We're still looking. We don't want to change. It's like, we can't turn things over to a minority. We can't turn things over to, you know, somebody whose gender is different than mine. We we can't do that. We're still looking at old white men to run. I mean, when is that going to change as as a voting group and and not just millennials? But we're still here we are. And yet we say we don't want old white men. But when we're going to go, we're going to go through this process. And who wants to make a bet with me that we don't get two old white guys as our main choices for president? (laughs) Yeah, I wish I could take the bet and feel like I had a chance, but I don't think it'd be very wise to take that bet. But I think that's the point, I guess, that I'm making is we're in this redefining renegotiating stage of we don't know you know we don't we don't really know collectively what we want we we decided somewhere along the way you know maybe starting with the 2008 election that it was time to start a new dynamic and we gave that new dynamic a, a, a approach for 8 years and then we said well you know there were some good things but there were a lot of things that we maybe didn't like so 2016 became the opportunity to renegotiate again, which is what happened. And then we didn't really like, we didn't love, you know, uh, four years there. So then in 2020, we were renegotiating again, but it's a lot of, I guess the point that I'm getting at from a millennial standpoint is millennials who were, you know, of a, of voting age experienced the end of an era, probably with George W. Bush of more conventional, and I shouldn't say conventional, more typical party politics that spanned a 40 or 50 year period. And I think when you look at American politics generally, that's a pretty standard sort of era of political definition. You know, you usually get like a a 40 to 50 year span of fairly consistent, you know, the parties. I mean, yeah, they change things throughout there, but generally speaking, they're kind of going in a certain direction. And the the way our politics are interacting has been negotiated for that time period. You know, so now I think what we hit is you have a generation that hit the the switchover point, right? Where for example, Gen X basically came of voting age and and lived, you know, the initial part of their voting life. They grew up in an environment that was a similar social contract in politics and they started their voting life and it was mostly that way up until just recently. 
for millennials, they didn't start with consistency and have never had any consistency. They're in that negotiating stage. And and the first Gen Zers are obviously in that stage too of saying that there's an, a, a standard operating procedure for politics right now, I think is, is difficult to do. We did that book, you know, whatever year and a half, two years ago, Lance, that was the, you know, the age of acrimony, right? That nobody, nobody talks about today, but you want to talk about a time when politics were nasty and they weren't civil and they weren't social and people right. died and were tarred and feathered. Like, you know, you look at post civil war up until early 1900s, that was pretty, that was pretty standard fare. You but know? your point is well taken in that, okay, if it's every 40 to 60 years, you know, or just pick yeah. 50 years, how many of those do you go through in your lifetime? So when you're going through it, Right. You personally, you're like, this is the only time it's right. ever happened. You know what I mean? And so sure. you're, you're like lost, you're scared, you're worried. And it's like, well, there's no need to be. Well, it's it's going to be okay. Whether you are around to see whether it's okay or not, you know, or you're like me. Okay. I saw it with, you know, as an eight to 12 year old. And now I'm seeing it again. You know, I mean, right. if you're, but. Well, an eight to 12 year old, how much of that did you really, I mean, you knew it was kind of yeah. going on, but you personally but only, I didn't know it personally, it. but as a history person, right. I can, re oh, yeah, I remember that. I, oh, That's I, about when I remember that was seeing that on TV. And, going okay. on. and so now I'm seeing it again, you know, so there's your 50 year period. So you either see it when you're really young or you're really old. If you see it for the, the change for the first time in your thirties and forties, that may be the only time you ever experience it. Right. So to you, it's new and it's different. But to your point, I agree. It's not different. It's it's and millennials tend to get all bent out of shape in, in my world of, oh my God, this is horrible. And it's just nobody's ever done this before. And this we as a country, as a person, is this is just this is awful. And we're just we're we're just so put upon. And it's like, no, you're not. It's just normal. The way things work. My daughters get tired of hearing me, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing me say that too. <laughs> but well, I think, you know, I'm sure they'll listen. So I'm sure they'll have reports. That's all to, I want. To I mean, I listen to with. them. I listen to you every day. <laughs> Don't always agree, but I listen. <laughs> I, I agree sometimes. I think I gave you two props today. You did. You so did. I mean I, you you better be flying high today. <laughs> I gave you credit for two good comments. Mark, mark this one down in history, folks. We're, it only took whatever fifteen hundred episodes or something. Uh, so why we do this show today, Lance? There's well, reason. because where we work, True Chat has mm. a mission, and that mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And we've done that today, especially in an atmosphere where, as we've talked about, there are people who really don't want it. But what, in our opinion, we think that's what most of us want. We want those respectful conversations. And if you've enjoyed today's show and it made you think a little bit, tell your family and friends. And if they'd like to think a little bit along with us, tell them as a podcast, they can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us releases new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday, first thing in the morning as a podcast. Those same episodes are heard on the weekends on AM and FM radio stations across the United States and parts of Canada. For The State of Us, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to senior producer Bradley Butch, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in, thestateofus.org.